Well, that is a good introduction to this next panel, which is preparedness, resilience, and global energy security uh, during the pandemic. Uh, the conversation will be led by Sharon Burke, uh, colleague at New America, uh, who is uh, runs our, our resource security program. She's a former assistant secretary of defense for energy security. Um, and uh, she will be in conversation with Ardo Reti, who's Senior Vice President of Corporate Affairs and Communications at Fortin, who's one of the sponsors of our conference. So thank you for that, sir. Uh, he was formerly Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Defense in Finland and also Director of the National Defense Policy Unit in Finland. Um, and I'll turn it over to Sharon now. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, it is great to be here with this wonderful forum again this year, and especially great to be here with Ardo Rati. Because Arto has a long military career behind him. He rose to the rank of Lieutenant General and was an important leader in the Finnish Defense Ministry, but he also works on energy security. So we're going to talk, we're going to start by talking about the theme that you just saw in that video about this confluence between hard security and human security and whether or not we're prepared for it. And I would submit to you that the coronavirus is a case in point. Um, Arto, before I ask you to react to the video, can you tell us something about that background that you have behind you? Because it looks like something special. That's, that's uh, actually, I mean, the company Showroom, which has the background of social media wall. Social media is, I mean, I mean it's a company didn't pay that much attention to social media earlier. Now it's our daily business. We need to follow carefully what happens around, and this really affects our, our business and our abilities to, to operate. I'm not sure that I want would want all my social media like looming over me like that, but kudos to you. Let, let me ask you. So about the the video, what do you think of that? Um, you know, the, the the pitch that we're making for for natural security instead of national security that we got to balance the two. I must say I really like the video. It's it, it's really takes the um, the change into account. However, for me, it's still missing some parts and. The, one is that when we talk about uh, national security or international security or nation security or nature security, uh, we need to go deeper in our comprehensive approach. Our nation has done it from the 1960s. We have trained our and educated our people for this kind of comprehensive approach in security. And uh, I chaired the uh, National Security Committee for five years. If I tell you the composition of the, of the committee, it tells you the the way we look at the issue. I was chairing as, as a permanent secretary of defense of Ministry of Defense, uh, the committee which is composed of uh, all the permanent secretaries of different ministries. It has the prime minister's office, this, the state secretary from there. It has the state secretary from the president's office, all the chief of security officers like uh, defense command, police, border guard, customs, and so on. All of them are there. Plus, we have industry, we have uh, NGOs, security supply agency, and so on. So it's really a comprehensive approach to prepare the, the uh, nation for any kind of crisis. And I say that I'm I'm back from I'm from the military myself. I'm a US under range also. So I have this kind of feeling of uh, military is, is a key player. However, it's only a one tool in our toolbox. And that has to be carefully. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you. And that is certainly was the upshot of that video is that we need to be able to approach security in a different way at this point. So what you're saying is Finland's always done it that way as a sort of whole of government, as we would say here, comprehensive security uh, solution. Is that fair to say that that's a longstanding approach yes. for your government? Of course, I can say today like that, but it's not really the truth. In the 1960s, uh, the society was uh, built in a way that we tried to train and educate our people to support the military defense of the country so that we can take all the powers from the civilian side, all the support to military if the need comes, because we had the uh, history very close to us and we are still living in the big nation and our eastern border who used to try to attack Finland a couple of times and failed in a way. But in the 80s, I would say 1980s, 1990s, it turned to be more like a total security concept where we actually moved the military into the military box and we took all the other players around the table and realized that we cannot handle any crisis in today's world without involving every single actor in the society. 
And it's not going to happen in one day. So we need to educate people also. So we started the kind of national defense courses where we take the, the cream of the society. I mean, members of parliament and, and uh, senior officers from ministries, industry, church, universities. They always have a similar kind of composition of people in the course. So we have trained from 1960, four courses per year, the main, the major leaders of Finland from every, every single sector in three weeks course to understand what the comprehensive security is. And they have played these tabletop exercises as one being the prime minister and president and so on, having these different kind of scenarios. And the scenario has changed from the military scenarios to very much civilian crisis, like COVID-19. And I must say that we survived COVID-19 pretty well. Of course, I must say also that um, even though we had plans, we had uh, trainings built, it was not 100% success. And one reason is that the Finns have a tendency to, to create the wheel always again. They don't follow those procedures. They have uh, studied and learned earlier. They want to create something new always. This happened also I, when COVID-19 started. I think that's probably not unique to Finland. I think uh, it's human nature <laughs> to want to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. But you know, I think that, that the way that Finland has built a shared sense of security that's then underscored by the, the way the leadership acts, the way you train people, all of that. I think that's I think that's where the United States needs to go. And we you know we've been there before in the Cold War. We had a much more integrated civilian military uh, defense, and I think it's where we need to go now. Is that what you what you think Europeans want to see from the United States? Is is that kind of um, more robust co uh, concept of security? Yes, and it's also something we would like to see in the most of European countries. This is not in every country the case. And, and I would say that the, one of the issues is civilian, civilian preparedness in the society. And most of the nations uh, dismissed their uh, security supply agencies after the Cold War. We did not. We sustained that. And this was the first time during my fourth year career in the military and now five years on the civilian side, that we actually took our Emergency Powers Act into use, and we opened our National Emergency Supply Agency stores. I've never seen this happen in the normal times. Now we did it. So I think this kind of preparedness, which goes deep into the roots of society's ability to survive, has to be reinvented in most countries. And hopefully, US is doing that also, because uh, crises are different. And and it's it's actually, as from the uh, military thinking, I would say the enemy is already inside. It is what do you mean by that? It means that, that you know we have we are close, we are all connected to internet. Cybersecurity is there, and I mean it's not something which is behind your borders. It's inside the country, and we have civilian unrest. We have a lot of issues ongoing, not only in the US but around the world, and it's not something you can defend by putting the military to the borders. It is something where you can utilize military capabilities if the military is well trained for that. But it's not something you can defend by military only. Military is needed, definitely. We need military forces for national security reasons and for international security also. But it's not the only tool. And so you need societal resilience, and that requires a, a more tools in the toolbox. Yeah, I would say one of the issues is that when we took this uh, emergency powers uh, act. Uh, um, into into the hands of the political leadership and started to, yeah, in a way, interfere into individual rights in Finland. When a very democratic country like Nordics are, it was something special. I think that the the history, the the education, the conscription we still have, has affected in a way that every single person in Finland has some kind of personal touch to security. So there was this kind of. Um, uh, acceptance for actions by the politicians in Finland. It was much easier to execute those um, actions than in many other countries where this kind of history has been fading away. Do you think, uh, do Europeans still want to see the United States play that kind of role, you know, bringing our values, our societal resilience to the table. What, what do you think at this point, given where things are, that what do you think Europeans want to see from the United States? 
Um, of course, I can only speak on my own behalf of that in that case, but. Uh, well, I'm a European, so that, that counts. <laughs> I'm a European, but what I can, see, what I hear and see, of course, is something that we want to see U.S. still to protect the democratic values in the world, as the U.S. has done earlier. But when it does that, the approach has to be, I would say, somewhat redefined, replanned. That we have this comprehensive approach. We understand the history of the, uh, of the um, so-called uh, crisis area. We also want to have U.S. to be transparent, um, cooperative, um, understanding partner. And this is quite, quite natural from our side. And of course, lately, some of the issues have not been like that, as we all know. But that's, I have to say, at the same time, Europe has its own problems also. Right. You want to, well, we'll have time to elaborate on that. And I also want to, invite the audience to start submitting questions at any time and we'll take them um, as as we as our conversation continues um well let's let's talk about some of the problems that your europe, europe is experiencing what what specifically concerns you the most at this point of course for me as, as a main phenomena what concerns is this kind of um, extremist uh, uprise and nationalistic movements and since to defend ourselves from the, from the crisis of today and to, to, to have a good economical situation in Europe, we need open borders and we need to have a good cooperation between countries. And it is one of the issues. Uh, we have been promoting in this company as a market model, energy only market. Now it seems that in many countries, this kind of uh, uh, national uh, uh, thinking is growing which means that the, the capacity markets are coming in, which means that every nation is building the extra capacity, not sharing. And I come from the Nordic area where we have this uh, Nord Pool area for energy, where we share the same market area. We sell, sell electricity in, in for minutes or for years ahead, depending on the situation, in one market. So everything is based, our energy security is not based on, on the capacity we have in our own country, is based on that one plus the grid system plus the transmission transmission system between countries and the capacity in other countries too so flexibility is one of the areas there so i would say this kind of protectionism is uh, one of the key elements i fear of course then we go to belarus situation and and others where we have uh, problems but that's a different case then when it comes to western countries in europe uh, this kind of uh, cooperative, uh, uh, non-nationalistic thinking is somewhat fading away, and that's that scares me. That scares me too, and I think we're seeing a similar phenomenon here in the United States. So it's a it's a global, I think, a global challenge that yeah. I hope it's something that our countries can work on together. But you mentioned energy as a as a, a, a area where you, the Nordic countries for sure are able to cooperate. That's not always, you know, energy security has not always been a, a unifying theme for Europeans. It's it's been a somewhat divisive topic over the years. Um, can we tell, you know, especially now that you've you've got that unique perspective of having had a military career and now an energy career? Can you talk a little bit about that and 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 you know Germany and Germany's energy footprint and how you look at some of these divisive energy dynamics in the region? Yeah, Fortum as a company, we just um, acquired 75% of a company called Uniper, which is um, a big major energy company in, 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 the, in Germany and in many other countries too, also in the Nordics and in Russia. And, and Germany has a challenge at the moment because they are, they are dismissing their nuclear capacity by the end of 21. Same time, they are uh, closing their coal power coal uh, uh, powered plants so they need to secure their energy supply and gas will play a major, major role in that one and then comes the question of gas pipes coming from russia which uh, there are several of those coming and now of course the question is about those two too that has been in the in the discussions i'm, I'm sure you will ask that anyway so i took that up now <laughs> Well, you saved me the trouble. Okay, that's good. But, but let's let's 
let's just to push a little bit on on why Germany is in the bind that it's in, because Germany has a very laudable commitment to promoting renewable energy and making a, a, a big step forward into the energy transition. And I know that as a company that also um, invests a great deal in renewable energy that you support that. But with an industrialized country such as Germany, it doesn't add up, does it? Not right now. So, so yeah. that's why you're saying natural gas has such an important role to play. It could play several decades an extremely important role, especially in the center of Europe, where gas is not only for the industry because the heating is uh, is taken care of by gas also. We don't have we have a gas heating uh, distribution network in our country, so we can use any kind of source for heat. Is it excess heat from the data centers or or gas or nuclear or whatever? But uh, in in Germany, gas plays a very crucial role in heating houses also. So for them, gas and, and making gas greener, then we come to hydrogen. And, and that's one of the reasons why we actually bought the company, uh, Uniper. They have a, a massive uh, gas trading, a gas, a, a global commodities business where, where gas trading is the major issue. They have gas uh, storages, they have gas transmission, they have uh, gas uh, plants, so they have the knowledge of gas, and they are also extremely well into the uh, hydrogen business, which is uh, the future step for gas becoming greener. We all know that, at least in Europe, where where the um, trend is now very strongly uh, close coal plants, and of course we also understand that the next one will be will be gas because that's fossil too. But understanding is also there that, that, that there will be a, it's a long transition phase. When it comes to energy transition, um, I would say there are three issues which we need to take in, into account to keep in our minds. One of them is that the energy has to be cheap enough for individual customers or industries or societies. It has to be made in a sustainable way. And the third one is that there needs to be a secure supply guaranteed in every, every step we take. And that is something we need to consider carefully. And there needs to be a grand plan behind the uh, the energy transition. And our company is now having uh, this one of the key elements in our policies to be one of the major players in the um, energy transition in Europe. Because we have the knowledge, we have every single kind of uh, production in our, our genes, and uh, we have a very strong will to make the world cleaner. So. That is worth celebrating. I congratulate you, but I just want to ask you as a pragmatic matter too. you know, going through a long energy transition that involves a reliance on gas. Um, it, it's going to be really problematic and, and certainly when you look at the trend lines, the global economy is still about 80% dependent on fossil fuels and, and global emissions of greenhouse gases have really not declined. So we're not getting to where we need to go and a continued reliance on gas is also not going to get us there. So, you know, and again, you're, you come out of a very pragmatic tradition as a military officer. Um, are we going to get where we need to go? Are we, are we going to succeed in the energy transition in going and making a transition away from greenhouse gas generating fuels? It's something I have to believe on. Otherwise I wouldn't work in the company where I'm at the moment. And, and this is the only way to go because uh, we need to do energy transition in, in the whole world. I know that there will be a long delay when it comes to Asia, for example, when it comes to Russia. Um, I mean, look in Europe, we have uh, 90 gigawatts of, uh, of gold at the moment. Uh, China has 1,200 and they are building 200 gigawatts more at the moment. So it's two times more they are building at the moment than Europe has at the moment. And every single plan, coal plant in Europe has a year when it's going to be closed, already decided. So it's from for us, I think it's possible. And I also believe that there will be new technologies uh, a lot during the next, um, I would say, 15, 20 years. And hydrogen is one of those, which is uh, maybe there as an industrial uh, product uh, in 10, 15, 20 years. So I you mentioned Russia. Yeah, so you believe it'll happen. Okay. Um, I, I mean, I do too, Tell's but I also, idea. yeah. I mean, like you said, what choice do we have? It's 
because if we fail, the consequences for societies all over the world are extreme, and it would be very hard to build a defense for that world. So um, I, I agree with you that we have to believe it's possible and then make the investments in the plans in, in getting there. Um, you and I have talked, I'm going to make a pivot here, so bear with me. You and I have talked a number of times now, um, and one of the points of discussion that, that we always, uh, that's always very interesting and where we don't always agree is, is Russia. And you mentioned Russia, so you brought it up. Um, it's hard as an American, and I see that we have a couple of, of questions, and one of them is about uh, the role of, of uh social media and seeing that as a virus in of itself. And of course, as a former defense person, I, for me, that's, that's all about Russia and the way that Russia is attacking my country. Um, but you have a, but Finland shares a very long border with Russia and you have a different point of view. I think it'd be interesting for our audience to hear what you have to say about that. So let me put you on the spot and, you know, is it possible, is it possible to get along with Russia and also uh, reject Russia's, uh, reject the president's approach to promoting his own version of security? That's a very tough question to answer, but that, let me put it was this way, that we have been living here all the time, and we had Russia as our neighbor, we have been in war with Russia in the past, and we have uh, been able to sustain good relations, even though things are not always something we like in Russia. And I, I learned Good principle from one, one of the, I think it was President Al Qasari who said it earlier that um, when you do peace negotiations, agreeing that you disagree is already an agreement. And I, I personally believe strongly that uh, with Russia, the only way to operate with Russia is to be tough, clear with your message. You can disagree, you have to disagree in certain issues. At the same time, you need to cooperate, you need to talk. Isolation of a nation you don't like, or political leadership you don't like, is never a solution in my mind. And of course, we have to hear, we have to live with Russia. And, and when it comes to energy, um, the argument that um, Russia is using energy as a political tool, I can say that some other nations are nowadays using energy as a political tool also, not only Russia, from uh, from individual nation point of view. Uh, what could you possibly mean by that? <laughs> Continue. I let you think about that. <laughs> no, <laughs> but, it's a, but but we have had uh, Germany, for example, has been uh, using Russian energy for decades with no problems. And I personally believe that uh, the business between Europe and Russia is extremely important from the security point of view. As long as we have connections, as, as long as we have discussions, and as long as we are depending in one way or another on each other, it makes makes sure that we have uh, some kind of a interaction ongoing. And, and when it comes to gas, I'm not uh, defending Nord Stream 2 or anything else like that. As I say, that the gas pipe has two ends. The other one brings gas, the other end brings euros. And I think in, in today's world, if the one matters more, that's the euro end at the moment. Russia needs the money. And that makes Russia to behave in a certain way when it comes to energy. In gas supply, Europe can also have, Europe has many sources, as we all know. And we have 21 LNG terminals in Europe. Germany is building two, two more. At least the political decision is that there will be two more. So there's another option too. So then actually the price dictates where the gas is bought from. We have a problem also in Europe that about uh, the, the Nord Stream 2 is about 50 PCM. The same amount is fading away from the European production by 2030. So we need to fill the gap somehow because we need the gas at the moment. LNG, if the price is correct, will be the one. Pipeline will be, the pipe gas will be the one if the price is correct. So there's many options at the moment. I'm just looking at a question that came in, and I've been weaving the questions into the discussion, but um, and trying to figure out how to pose it. But um, it, you know, the 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 person who's asking the question is talking about that that unbridled technocratic neoliberalism is uh, is politically toxic, and how do we transform 
to an economy that enhances global and national security based on equity and the greater good for all. And I think to some degree, you started to answer this question already um, when you were talking about the energy transition, but bring it all home for us to, to round out the discussion about, you know, we've, you've, you've said that the rising tide of, of nationalism, uh, the sort of crumbling commitment to democratic values, the pressure that's coming from places like Russia. Well, I'm saying that you didn't really say that. Um, the it's challenges. Okay, then we both we agree on that. The mm -hmm. the challenges of the energy transition, and of even if we succeed in in the right time frame, which we don't have very much time. We have about 12 years, I think, is what the United Nations says. We still have to deal with the consequences that are locked in. So, you know, how do we how do we bring that all together? into a, a, a more constructive vision. Again, you said before you were optimistic. You're still optimistic when you put it together like that with a question like this that that is inherently I'm, skeptical. Yeah, I'm optimistic when it comes to climate change. I'm hoping that people must realize where we are heading to. That's something people must realize. There's no other option existing. However, I know that there are nations where this will take much longer time than it should be take. The only, only solution is this kind of, it's nice to say, the only solution is a strong political will and cooperation across the borders. Because climate change is, is a fight which cannot be fought inside the country. It has, been fought, it has to be fought together. And then technical solutions. US, for example, is full of new ideas of battery technology, SMRs, small and medium sized, uh, small modular reactors. So these issues like this, when they are into market and they can change the, uh, the uh, energy climate, but at the same time, I'm only talking about energy here. That's all about 20% of the total emissions. Then we need to talk about agriculture, infrastructure, uh, transportation, and so on, industries. So we, there's a lot to do in that sense. And I think Europe has the possibility because we have a high ambition level to show the uh, example to the world in that sense. And I think the European Commission's uh, latest decisions show that we are trying to do that, to be carbon neutral by 2000, uh, 2050 and uh, having a 55% reduction by 2035. And that's an aim I also want to support with a full heart. Well, I think you see a lot of progress across the United States. We'll be able to join you in that. And I just want to finish on a note, too, to say that um, I understand the question that we got was kind of hostile to technology. But I think innovation is going to be a really important force for change here for the better. And we just have to make sure that we're harnessing it in that way. And I think you've laid out a compelling vision for how the United States and the nations of Europe and Finland in particular can work together um, for our security interests, and especially if we're defining security more broadly than just as force of arms, but as something that comes from a whole government, as we would say here. So, Arthur, I want to thank you very much for the conversation. I, I, every time we talk, I learn something new and um, a, a new point of view that I think I need to take on board, and I'm glad that you could share that experience with our audience. Thank you, Sharon.